Hello, Internet. Welcome to what is likely the final quarantine watch episode of Creative Differences. Movie theaters are opening and almost all of us are fully vaccinated. So we're going to be out in these streets. I'm Dallas and my side effects from the vaccine were so negligible that I kind of think they didn't inject me with anything. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm Colin and um, like... I want there to be a way to test that that doesn't involve just giving you COVID and seeing what happens. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. And I'm Demi, and I've only had one shot, and you guys already heard what my symptoms were. Welcome to another episode of Creative Differences Podcast, your one-stop shop for movie reviews, Throwback Thursdays, and Fancast Fridays, and a number of other things. Like Dallas said, today we are doing what is quite possibly our final quarantine watch because as he said we're gonna be out in these streets because we're gonna be vaccinated yep so if you guys listened to last week's episode we did our final tv show watch today we are going to do our final movie watch gabby cannot be with us this time just like dallas couldn't be with us last time so it yeah, works we out places. we've switched them out guys uh so yeah well two things first thing like Part of the reason why I feel like they didn't inject me with anything is because <laughs> when I heard you and Gabby and other people tell me how they got basically just mollywopped by <laughs> these vaccines, I was like, I should have been like laid out because I take medication that make like it's like immunosuppressive to the point where after my second dose, the nurse was like, oh, you should probably stay for a little extra time for the... uh what do they call it? observational period? Yeah. And I was like, yeah, work. And then went home. Didn't really have a lot of arm pain. Lucky. Didn't really have a lot of anything. <laughs> I was Lucky. like, yeah. Did they put water in my arm? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not anticipating possibly having a fever when I take my second shot in a couple of weeks. Eh, yeah, you'll be fine. We'll see. It's what fine happens. for like a day or two. Also, before we get into the actual episode, Please like and subscribe because now that Arclight is dead, we have to pay for movies again. And it'd be nice to monetize this so I can fund my movie tickets. Fair point. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Guys, movie movie reviews are about to start coming out kind of late. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's not going to be that. Oh, Thursday night. Uh, clock out and walk into the theater. No, I guess it depends on a... what movie, though. I mean, yeah, we can try to see the movies Thursday night. but I mean, Black Widow's coming out on time. We're going to see that. I'm seeing it on Thursday. We recording, homie. <laughs> <laughs> there will be exceptions to the CPT rule, I'm sure. Absolutely. All right, Dallas, you want to mm. start us off with your first movie on the list? Yes. Oh, also, and, usually we would mm. do five movies. I think Dallas is still doing five movies. I have more than five. I'm just going to rattle off the rest of my list. Yes, I'm doing five because I respect the structure and the format of this. Uh, it's the last episode. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah. Speaking of the structure and the format and things that only I do, I start all of my entries with what could be classified as a hint or could be classified as just a random statement. You can be the judge of that. Anyway, the first one is a documentary that's perfect for Marvel nerds like me. Uh, did, Oh, wait. I know what you're talking about, but I don't know the name of it. That's fair. Colin looks like he does not care or know what I'm talking about. Yep. <laughs> it's called Marvel's Behind the Mask. Nice. Yes, that one. I was like, I was going to yeah. say 616 and I was like, no, that's a TV series one. Yeah, I honestly was very confused when I was looking for it because I thought I was looking for 616. And then I was like, wait, what am I watching? Marvel's busy right now. Anyway, documentary directed by Michael Jacobs and featuring a bunch of people, including Brian Michael Bendis, Kelly Sue DeConnick, Christopher Priest, Reginald Hudlin, Greg Pak, and uh, DMC from Run DMC. <laughs> I didn't expect okay. to see him, but apparently, yeah, apparently he was really in the comics growing up, so that was cool. Documentaries have IMDb summaries too, and this one is Meet the writers and artists behind characters like Black Panther, Miles Morales, Miss Marvel, Luke Cage, the X-Men, Captain Marvel, and many other characters in the Marvel Universe, highlighting their impact on pop culture and media. And that sounds as standard as it can, but it was actually really interesting. They go in different, you know, it's a documentary, they have different kind of sections. They talk about feminism and how comics were affected by that and how they were before they were affected by that. Same with representation for Black people, for Asian people, gay people, all kinds of demographics, and how it's kind of like they show before and after they started to make these changes to actually have representation. And there were just some interesting like little tidbits that I took notes of because I was like, ooh, I want to bring that up later. There's a writer named 
Don McGregor, and he was a white dude, and he was in the 60s, and he talks about Black Panther and how it was, like, the first with an all-black cast of characters over there. Yeah. When they were starting, someone at Marvel wanted the Avengers to come help T'Challa, and he was like, no, <laughs> this is not that book. <laughs> he said, I don't want it to be a book where the white guys come in and have to help the black guy because he can't do it. T'Challa can take care of everything. And I was like, yo, shout out to you, Don, because... T'Challa can do everything. Yes. And this was the 60s and he was a white dude saying this. So like Marvel had some some cookout invitees <laughs> writing back then. They had some progressives up in there. Yeah. 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 People ahead of their time. There's also a funny story about one of the Howling Commandos, Gabe Jones, who yeah. I think is uh, Derek Luke, right? Derek Luke's character. Yes. So <clears throat> when they first came out, he was colored Caucasian. Because the printers had assumed he was colored black by mistake. <laughs> yeah, they were like, "What? Uh, you got? I I don't." <laughs> they were apparently just like, "Oh, they accidentally made this one brown." So <laughs> when what? they put it out, he was a white dude. And then Stan Lee called and yelled at them, and then he was changed back to a black dude. That's horrible. Yeah, it was so out of the realm of possibility that we'd have black comic book characters that they thought it was literally a mistake. And this is why nowadays when we make comic book movies, we tend to cast more characters as people of color, even if they were white in the comics, because white was clearly the default. <laughs> yes. And speaking of that, they mentioned the X-Men, who were obviously meant to represent the groups who were, movement. yeah, like otherized. But initially it was still just a bunch of white people. Yeah. Beast, Iceman, uh, Professor X, Jean Grey, Cyclops, like so much of white dudes. Yeah. So in the 70s, they started to introduce more diverse characters like Storm, the other ones. There's a lot of white people <laughs> in X-Men, but you know. Jubilee. Yeah, I don't know when Jubilee came in, but Jubilationly showed up later. They talked about Carol Danvers and how she was created in the 70s to try to capitalize on feminism because, you know, they didn't know what they were doing with female characters. And they still didn't know what they were doing because <laughs> Kelly Sue DeConnick talks about how heavy handed it was. Carol was the editor of Women Magazine <laughs> when she first started. They were like, what do, what do women what do women do? Uh, they read magazines. What's a good name for a women's magazine? <laughs> women Magazine. <laughs> Going a little too hard in the paint there, guys. <laughs> yes. So, you know, they weren't super subtle, but they, uh, they learned how to write. And then last thing I bring up is Brian Michael Ben. This was more of a modern part they talked about uh brian michael bennett's creating miles morales yeah he also created riri oh i actually didn't know that that's pretty, pretty I, cool i think he created riri williams as well nice but he was talking about you know spider-man and kind of redoing him for the ultimate universe and he was saying if you unpack the origin of spider-man he's a kid from new york he lives with his aunt he's a science nerd like there's nothing that inherently says caucasian in that yep so they're like if we did this again we should do it with a kid of color and then boom miles morales and the best spider-man movie ever years later <laughs> Yes. It's you funny because it's that. true. Haha. <laughs> but yeah, it's a really cool documentary and they have a bunch of little stories. Those are just a few. Obviously, you'll like it more if you're into Marvel. But even if not, just like seeing an industry change over time and seeing what that kind of stuff was like before, it's pretty dope. So yeah. I recommend it for people like me and to me. It reminds me that I really need to watch Marvel Studios Assembled for the Falcon and the Winter Soldier because I still have not watched that one. I watched the WandaVision one. I haven't watched the Falcon and the Winter Soldier one. I'm surprised. I feel like you'd be doing that. You'd be doing that quick. It came out during the two weeks that I was working and didn't have time to watch anything. Uh, that makes sense. So I'm still catching up on things that I've missed. All right. So the first movie that I'm going to talk about is a movie that I watched, I want to say, back in November or October. <laughs> It was a while ago. I watched Late Night, which at the time was on Amazon Prime. I can't tell you if it's still on there now. It's been so long. Uh, it was directed by Nisha Ganatra, and it stars Emma Thompson, Mindy Kaling, John Lithgow, Hugh Dancy, and Reed Scott. A late night talk show host suspects that she may soon lose her long running show. That's not the entire story. That's like one part <laughs> of it, but like, whatever. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about it because Gabby has already talked about it before because she has seen it. And that was kind of why I was disappointed that she wasn't going to be in this episode because I was waiting for the moment that I could say, right. hey, I watched Late Night finally. I think she did that last time. I think she missed the episode where I talked about King of Staten Island. Yeah. And I was like, Gabby, 
that was this is for you this is for you we watched movies for you when you were not here <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a really entertaining m- movie i think emma thompson and mindy kaling are really great together in it uh, i really enjoyed the story i love that it was set in like the tv industry and that mindy kaling's character has like these realistic boundaries and obstacles in the writer's room seeing as she's the only woman and the only person i think she's the only person of color in the writer's room as well goodness so like that's already like hard enough you know yeah i just i really enjoyed it uh i thought it was gonna be somewhat interesting when i first saw the trailer back when it was in theaters it was just not a movie that i saw what tipped the scales for me to finally watch it other than it being on amazon prime meaning it meaning it was easier to to stream was um one of the actresses from prodigal son halston sage is in she's in the movie she's in a scene which I kind of figured before I started watching the movie anyway, but I kind of had already wanted to see it anyway, but that was kind of just the tipping point and Halston's cool. So it was worth it, but yeah, it's a really entertaining movie. I would recommend it. It's just a good time. Just sit back, relax. There's, you know, a good amount of drama and it's pretty funny. Word. That's the first movie on my list. It's late night and I will try and find the episode where Gabby talks about it so that I can link it for you guys listening to the podcast on YouTube. Very considerate. What's next on your All list? All right. Next on my list is a movie that combines childhood nostalgia and current celebrities to make something that is fine. I feel like I should know this. I just. I mean, it's not much of a hint. I just can't figure it out now. What is it? The SpongeBob movie, Sponge on the Run. You watched that, really? I did. I did. So here's, here's, here's what happened. I have a niece. Yes. She's nine. Mm-hmm. And Kayla was like, hey, they're doing this thing at the Rose Bowl where it's kind of like one of those drive through experiences. Yeah. Where you like stay in your car and then you drive and there's like interactive stuff that you can do on the phone and look at pictures and blah, 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 blah. And then at the end, you park the car and you watch the movie, SpongeBob movie, Sponge on the Run. A couple things. One, I would have sworn this movie came out like years ago. <laughs> I feel like this movie has been being advertised for like 11 years. And in fairness, I didn't watch any of the SpongeBob movies. So anytime I see a SpongeBob poster at a movie theater, I'm like, oh, the SpongeBob. Really? Movie. Even the one with Scarlett Johansson? Yeah, I never even saw the that one, like the first one. Yeah. And then I think they made a second one. I don't know. I I've, the, I've I only know. ever acknowledged the one that has Scarlett Johansson in it. <laughs> right. So I think that's the SpongeBob movie. And then I think the next one is called Sponge Out of Water, if I'm not mistaken. I thought that was this one. <laughs> this is Sponge on the Run. Oh. And if I'm not mistaken, please, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of SpongeBob movies. <laughs> or there's three. I don't know. That's the point. Is it always feels like there's a SpongeBob movie out, and I can never tell you which one it is. But we went to this thing because we have a niece. And it was really cool. They give you snacks, you popcorn, some little chocolate. There was music videos playing. There was a little uh, trivia with Tom Kenny and Bill Fagerbaki. Super dope. And I want to say a shout out to Dorian Parks from uh, Geeks of Color. Oh, Geeks of Color, yeah. Because I follow him on Twitter and he posted a video from the, <laughs> the SpongeBob drive-in thing. And there's a video. Of <laughs> they have people dressed in suits like SpongeBob and Patrick and all that. And they're like dancing around. And for some reason, like Dorian's sitting in his car and he pans to the right and when he pans back left patrick is like basically inside his car <laughs> like he's <laughs> leaned all the way in his driver's seat window and dorian screams in patrick's face <laughs> and it's the funniest scream and patrick gets scared and he gets scared <laughs> i would also like be one scared. of the funniest things i saw on twitter yeah it was great oh it was so funny but yeah dorian shout out to you that was the most entertaining thing related to this but the movie though it is written and directed by tim hill who developed the show and wrote the SpongeBob SquarePants movie, which I think is the first one. <laughs> and also he directed Max Keeble's Big Move. Yeah, I love which that, is that movie. movie that yeah, some of us saw when we were kids. It stars Tom Kenny, Bill Fagerbaki, Clancy Brown, Keanu Reeves, and Matt Berry. Choices. Yeah. Keanu Reeves is in the movie way more than I expected, but I'll get to that later. Summary is after SpongeBob's beloved pet snail Gary is snail napped, he and Patrick embark on an epic adventure to the lost city of Atlantic City to bring Gary home. And uh yeah, it's a uh, Gary gets snatched up and then they go to what just feels like 
the actual version of Atlantic City, but with fish in it. All right. <laughs> and yeah, there's like gambling, casinos, all that fun stuff. Keanu Reeves is a sage named Sage. Okay. Like, you know, sage, like the, it's like an herb, a plant. Yeah. Yeah. He just like rolls like a tumbleweed and then it's Keanu Reeves' face in it and he gives them advice. <laughs> that sounds very strange. That sounds like some SpongeBob stuff. Yes. And it also sounds like some Keanu Reeves stuff. He was great. But speaking of that, there are so many cameos, way more than I expected. Aquafina's in this movie, Snoop Dogg is in this movie, Danny Trejo's in this movie, Tiffany Haddish is in this movie. But it's just, it's so weird. And I know SpongeBob has always been weird, but I feel like it's gotten weirder over time. Oh, yeah. I feel like cartoons have gotten weirder over time, just in general. Yeah, that's the thing. Is it start? That's the thing, though. It started when I was seven. Yeah. You know, when you're a kid, you tolerate weird things because you don't know how insane they are. But man, now that you're an adult, it's just, different. Yeah, I don't know if it's just. <laughs> I think they might have just made it weirder as I've gotten older. So everything kind of like works together. But yeah, it was nice to see that SpongeBob could still make me laugh after all these years because it was pretty funny. It was super weird to see in like today's 3D animation. Yeah, when I saw the trailer, I was like, this isn't right. Yeah, I was like, something feels off. Especially Sandy. Her eyes look super creepy. But she's not in a whole lot of the movie, so it doesn't really matter. Yeah, it's a, it's a weird time. But I recommend it if you have kids <laughs> to watch it with. And if you like SpongeBob, I would hope. I don't know. I like SpongeBob, and no, nah, it's fine. Wasn't it for you? Not enough. But with the whole experience, it was great. It was a nice, it was a fun night. For an okay movie. <laughs> but that's Spongebob. The second, third, or fourth movie. I don't know. One of them. One to you. Awesome. So the next one, actually, this is a two for one because I'm so good at those. So technically, there's oh, fun. seven movies on my list. Back in December, uh, Netflix released a documentary and a concert. It was Shawn Mendes in Wonder and Shawn Mendes Live in Concert. Uh, Shawn Mendes in Wonder was directed by Grant Singer and Live in Concert was directed by Paul Dugdale which is an interesting last name. The documentary... Time out, time out, time out, time out. Yeah. What's the last name? Dugdale. Dugdale. Yeah. <laughs> so, like... Not quite Dimmodome. Like the first half... Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. the first half of Doug Dimmodome and the last half of Dimsdale. Yeah. Dugdale. Yeah. Well, also, isn't Doug Dimmodome's kid named Dale Dimmodome? <gasps> oh, my God. He, I think it is. I think his name is Dale. <laughs> that This is... This is a made-up name. <laughs> this is an alias. <laughs> It's, it's Doug or Dale Dimodo. Oh, my goodness. But continue. Yeah, the documentary In Wonder stars Sean Mendez, Camila Cabello, as well as Sean's family and, you know, his crew, like his band and all those people. Because, you know, you're following him on tour. And it's like his manager and his agent or whatever. Um, and then live in concert is Sean Mendez and also features Camila Cabello. In Wonder is a portrait of singer-songwriter Sean Mendez's life, chronicling the past few years of his rise and journey. And Live in Concert is in his hometown of Toronto. Shawn Mendes pours his heart out on stage with a live performance in a stadium packed with adoring fans. Pretty run of the mill and standard when you're watching a music documentary <laughs> and a concert movie, I guess you could call it. Yeah. I personally really like music docs and concerts for artists, obviously, that I enjoy. I probably don't care if it's not an artist that I already listen to <laughs> a considerable amount. Um, and I Makes like John Mendez, man. He just seems like he's he's a really nice, cool dude. And I think that the documentary really emphasizes that. Like, he's just a normal guy who just happens to be doing what he loves on a really large platform. So, like, there's, like, a, a cool look at what his touring life is like as well as, you know, what the studio process is like. As somebody who grew up with a dad who is a music producer and my mom also used to work in the music industry in a sort of fashion – that sort of industry has always kind of interested me, especially artists and the way that their lifestyle kind of works. So that's why I really like touring documentaries as well, because it's just really cool. It's like you're on a tour bus for like months and months at a time going to different places all over the world. Like, how often are you seeing your family? When do you have time to take days off? Like you're on tour and you're traveling the world. The answer is not often. Yeah. <laughs> there was also like there's a part in the documentary where something goes wrong with like his throat like I can't remember if he he got caught like laryngitis or something like that but it was like super bad and his he couldn't speak they put him on vocal rest and he had to cancel a concert and like when that's your livelihood and like when people are you know counting on you for their entertainment and stuff like that like obviously you feel really bad about that stuff 
It's a really sad moment in the documentary. But anyway. Sounds like it. Yeah, it's pretty it's a pretty good documentary. It ends on a note that I felt like it could easily transition into like you could listen to his album, his latest album Wonder immediately after you watch the documentary because it kind of goes into it's about him t- his last tour but also sort of about the recording process of his last album. So it ends on like kind of the the musical notes of the intro song of the album so it's like you could stop watching that documentary and immediately just listen to the album and i think that's kind of cool it is pretty cool i want to say that i watched the documentary either the week after the album came out or the week before i can't remember but also like the live tour is also really great like he's a really good performer and it goes really well with the documentary so if you like sean mendez even a little you'll probably enjoy both of these and they are both on netflix so feel free to check them out Dallas, what's next on your list? Next hint statement, random thing to say, is Daisy Ridley is playing a space girl again. Chaos Walking. Hey, look at you. I wanted to see that movie so bad and I still haven't. I wanted you to see that movie so bad and you still haven't. I will probably eventually. I think it's on Voodoo now, so maybe I'll rent it or something. I think you'll like it. It's directed by Doug Lyman, who directed The Born Identity, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, and Edge of Tomorrow. I like, among other things, several of those movies. Yeah, he's, he's, he's got a good track record. It was written by Christopher D. Ford, who wrote Spider-Man Homecoming with a bunch of other people, and Patrick Ness, who wrote the Chaos Walking book trilogy, which it turns out is a book trilogy. I didn't know yeah, that before I saw the they movie. they pretty wisely chose to just call the movie Chaos Walking because the knife of never letting go just doesn't flow as well. Yeah, it's a, not a great movie title, but Chaos Walking is much better. He also wrote A Monster Calls, the book and the movie. So he'd be, he be writing books and movies. I heard A Monster's Call was, was really good. I didn't see it. It looked very sad. Is that the one Felicity Jones in it? Possibly. I don't remember. She's like dying. She has a kid. I think that is that I one. think so. Yeah. And then he's like, oh, my mom's dying. I need to talk to this monster. I, yeah. I haven't seen the movie. Anyway, <laughs> it stars Tom Holland, Daisy Ridley, Maz Mickelson, David Oyelowo. Oyelowo? Oyelowo? A yellow, what'd you say, Colin? <laughs> yellow wolf? <laughs> I think it's a yellow wolf. It feels like you're saying it too fast. You're I rushing don't know. through it. But I don't know. I don't speak. That. We know who you're talking about. <laughs> you yes. Don't speak that. I don't. And uh, Cynthia Rivo, she's in that too. Also, Nick Jonas. Yes. That was random. He just popped in, being antagonizing. Summary is two unlikely companions embark on a perilous adventure through the Badlands of an unexplored planet as they try to escape a dangerous and disorienting reality where all inner thoughts are seen and heard by everyone. That is mostly true. It only happens to men, Mm -hmm. but there are basically no women, but you know, Daisy Ridley's in the movie. And so it's where did the men come from? (laughs) No, like women, (laughs) this isn't a universe in which women never existed. They're, they're gone. There were women appeared one day and now they're not there. You follow? So just the women died. Yes. Yeah, supposedly. Well, I mean, men die, too. The people die. But, like, in a level of, like, they're not level here anymore. being gone, yes. All yeah. the women are gone. Well, sucks for humanity, I guess. It really does. But also, Cynthia Rivo's there, so not all the women are gone. <laughs> and Daisy Ridley is also there, so, you yeah. know. But if you've seen the trailer, you know, she shows up, and Spider-Man is like, whoa, a girl. And Ray's like, yeah, I'm a girl. Yeah, what's the big deal, kid? The really dope thing is how they use the premise. It's very creative. It's not something that I've ever heard of before because, you know, I don't read. So I've never heard (laughs) of The Knife of Never Letting Go. So, yeah, I didn't even know it was a book until after we saw the movie. I was like, that was really cool. That was creative. I had it at one point. You had the book? Yeah. I don't think I do anymore. I think I gave it to a library, but I had it. All right. Well, did you read it? Yes. I remember reading it and not really feeling it. And I think that's why I never read the sequels. Fair. But yeah, I think this is a really cool thing for a movie premise. I'm sure it worked as a book too. Maybe, I don't know. Don't read. But visually, it's very captivating to see the projection of everyone's thoughts. And it's not just like you think something and then words. Like sometimes if you're picturing something, you'll see the image floating by their head, like what Tom Holland is picturing. Sometimes if your thoughts are really angry, like uh, David, David O, he's like a really angry dude to the point where his character is actually terrifying and it was really cool because i've never seen him like that i haven't seen him in most things he's been in but he doesn't really strike me as the actor who like strikes fear 
but man, dude was terrifying. And his thoughts kind of have this like fiery quality to him. So like the visuals of that are super dope. Tom Holland is always a treasure. Always, like obviously he brings a surprising amount of humor into this movie because the movie is super bleak in premise and like, look, it's kind of gloomy. All the women are gone. That can't be good. Something happened there. You hope for a miracle, but probably not. <laughs> That's my John Mulaney joke for the week. But yeah, I appreciated Tom Holland bringing in some humor because he always does. And he's always great. And yeah, since the movie is based on the trilogy, I'm hoping that we can get, I mean, yes, I'm hoping that we can get sequels. I don't know how, you know, like box office versus budget works in a pandemic because I saw this movie at a drive-in. Also don't know how that works in a pandemic. Yeah. So it's kind of hard to gauge. Like, oh, this movie did really well because movie theaters were closed when it came out. So I've been waiting years for this movie to come out and it felt like it was never coming out. And then they dropped it in the middle of a pandemic. And it was just like, well, that's a choice. I'm surprised. I yeah. I don't know when I'm ever going to see this movie now. But yeah, I, yeah, I've been excited to see it since they were like, yo, Tom Holland and Daisy Ridley are starring in it. And I was like, you took my favorite Spider-Man and you took the woman who plays my favorite Star Wars character and you put him in a sci-fi movie. Yeah, I want to see that. Yeah. Because I remember, I mean, this movie was supposed to come out ages ago. I want to say that this was supposed to come out before rise of skywalker came out because tom holland is in that d23 video where they're trying to get spoilers out of daisy ridley and i thought that was really funny because i know tom is Uh, in it because they were co-stars for that movie oh i didn't even i didn't know that i don't know why he was in that yeah they were they had already done the entire movie by that point so i was wondering when this movie would ever come out and now it's out and i still haven't seen it want want yeah i just randomly saw a trailer for it one day on the youtube and i was like hey tom hey there's really tom holland mads mickelson and his villain face <laughs> but <laughs> that's hilarious and his villain it's very face. good and i recommend it if you like tom holland and or daisy ridley i like or, both yeah just you know bleak semi-post-apocalyptic stories i like those too boom you're all in i mean i sent a message earlier saying i don't know why i keep watching handmaid's tale and then i watch the next episode so <laughs> <laughs> yeah you uh, you know what you like. I do. I do. I do. I you do. You just don't know why you like it. You know what? Maybe it's a good thing I don't know why I like it. It's fair. All right. So next up on my list is another music sort of thing. I don't know how to describe it. It's Folklore, The Long Pond Studio Sessions, which you can find on Disney Plus, directed by Taylor Swift, starring Taylor Swift, Aaron Desner, Jack Antonoff, and Justin Vernon. In Folklore, the Long Pond Studio Sessions, Taylor Swift performs each song in her, in order of her album, Folklore, and reveals the stories and secrets behind all 17 songs. So, this made me really enjoy the Folklore album more than I already did. Uh, it's not quite a concert film, obviously, because there's, you know, nobody there. It's just the people <laughs> who are performing. And it's also not quite a documentary. They perform the song, these four people perform the songs from the album in this studio session or in the studio recording area. Uh, And then they'll go outside and they'll talk about each individual song and how they came up with it or the writing process or the recording process or anything like that because it was all recorded during quarantine. Uh, Okay. It's really chill in like the same way that the album is also super chill. Like you watch it and it's like, yeah, there's just like a cool vibe. Everybody's vibing right now. We're just playing the music. But, like, there's also just something about watching an artist perform their music that's different to just listening to an album. Like, there's just a a certain type of energy that you don't get from just listening to the album itself. But, yeah, and then when you're watching it, there's also just a lot of cool tidbits about the making of the album. Like, I think this was the, I don't know what to call it, the movie, the documentary. I don't know. It's This is where... (laughs) <laughs> Taylor, this is where Taylor Swift revealed that um, her current boyfriend, Joe Alwyn, was actually a co-writer on several of the songs on the album, and he just went under a ghostwriter. And now they're both hmm. Grammy winners because the album won a Grammy. Nice. It's really dope. But yeah, that is Folklore, the Long Pond Studio Sessions. If you like Taylor Swift and if you liked her Folklore album, definitely check it out because it's really cool to watch her perform the songs live as well as talk about all of the music and all the songs and how and the creative process behind all of them with her producers because they all the guys who are in the the film with her are producers and co-writers with her on the album sounds dope dallas what you got next the next one is a reminder that if you're good at something you should stick with it and that applies to the protagonist and the screenwriter good luck 
I, I, yeah, I don't know. Colin, anything? I want- How are you going to sum up the movie by its message? I wouldn't even call that the message of the movie. That's just kind of what the movie made me think. What are you talking? Which movie is this? I feel like I know what it is, and I just can't even think about what it is. That's fair. I don't think either of you saw it. It's called Nobody. Ah, I never did see Nobody. Yes. Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Nobody is directed by Ilya Nashuler, who directed Hardcore Henry. The guy I knows it, what he likes. It looked action-y. Yeah. And it was written by Derek Kolstad, who was the creator and writer of the John Wick franchise. According to Wikipedia, lives in Pasadena. So shout out to you, Derek. Hey, also wrote a few episodes of The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, according to Sean. Oh, right. Yeah. And that's why I say that uh, if you're good at something, you should stick with it. Because John Wick is great. Derek really apparently likes that style of thing. Because nobody is basically a John Wick movie, but with Bob Odenkirk instead of Keanu Reeves. But it stars, in addition to Bob Odenkirk, Connie Nielsen, who is someone in Wonder Woman. She is Hippolyta. She's um, Wonder the Queen Woman's mother. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, Connie, uh, Riza from Wu Tang, and Christopher Lloyd was a nice little surprise, but not for you if you haven't seen the movie because I just ruined that surprise. Anyway, we can always take that out. <laughs> <laughs> Some <laughs> summary is a bystander who intervenes to help a woman being harassed by a group of men becomes the target of a vengeful drug lord. That does happen, but you could also summarize it by saying. An older gentleman who used to have a particular set of skills, Mm -hmm. he dusts off his particular set of skills when he gets into conflict with a Russian crime family. Uh, John Wick? Yes, that's how you would describe John Wick. And it's also how you would describe nobody because Derek Kolstad sticks with what he likes. Man, this movie is so much of John Wick down to the vaguely not even vaguely extremely russian villain who is targeting him because his name isn't john in this movie he has a name hutch his name is hutch because hutch does something to his kid and then he's like well now i gotta kill this old dude and he's like well i'm john wick nigga so no you're not (laughs) he doesn't say that for multiple reasons because he's not john wick and he can't say nigga but yeah it's good Derek host that you're good at writing action movies Bob Odenkirk trained for years, apparently, to do this, which I thought was super dope. Because he's like, I think he's like pushing 60. But he wanted to do all of his own fighting and stunts. So he trained until he was, you know, in a spot to be able to fight a bunch of niggas on a bus. And then he did that. I like it. Also, it's always nice to see Rizzo pop up in a movie because he's, yeah, he's an actor. I always, like, I know him as a rapper, obviously, and a producer. But he always just pops up kind of randomly in movies. Often in action movies, like, uh, what's that movie? Mr. Right? Demi, have you seen that movie? It has Anna Kendrick and Sam Rockwell. No, I don't think I have. It's super random, but it's super fun. And Riz is randomly in it, just like he's randomly in this. And I loved it. And also, Christopher Lloyd was a lovely addition. I'm just going to stop acting like that's a surprise. But he was great. <laughs> he's like an older, older guy with a particular set of skills. Because he's, Christopher Lloyd is great. Yeah, he's been old since, like... Forever. Yeah. Kind of like Morgan Freeman. Yeah. Is he white Morgan Freeman? Never mind. It's not <laughs> he might be. But one thing I did appreciate about this movie is that we didn't have to watch a family or a family member get murdered as an inciting incident because, man, am I sick of that. So shout out to Derek not killing off anyone's wife or son or puppy. Or daughter. Or daughter, aunt, uncle, cousin. I mean, people died, so I shouldn't say that. But like, <laughs> it's not the reason that people the movie People died. Yes, people die. As Rafa would say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But yeah, that's nobody. It's a fun time. I recommend it if you like John Wick and or Bob Odenkirk. I would not recommend it to Colin. It's, cool. It's just 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 an action movie. <laughs> you don't like action movies. So speaking of RZA, the next movie Ooh. on my list is Cutthroat City, which you can find on Netflix, hey. directed by RZA, starring Shamik Moore, Demetrius Ship Jr., Denzel Whitaker, Kian Johnson, Kat Graham, T.I., Terrence Howard, Rob Morgan, Asa Gonzalez, and Ethan Hawke. Set after Hurricane Katrina, four boyhood friends out of options reluctantly accept an offer to pull off a dangerous heist in the heart of New Orleans. Yeah. So I enjoyed the movie, but not as much as I thought I was going to, because I waited Yo, same. like two years for this movie to come out. <laughs> yeah, but like it had like... Some pretty cool and good unexpected like choices in there, which I would talk about, but then I would be spoiling the movie, so I'm not going to do that. 
I wish that the movie had stayed smaller in scope and more personal with the four leads because yeah. it seems to lose itself to the bigger elements like later on like the bigger elements that they get drawn into and i'm just like I, there's so much i'm like i'm lost now what's happening what? right by the end of the movie i'm like wait who was he and why did <laughs> it matter <laughs> why is terrence howard here now <laughs> Yeah, that's like three quarters into the movie. And I'm just like, why? What's happening? Why does this matter? So we're just now getting Terrence Howard. And now he's another, like, he's a big bad. He's something we need to worry about. What's happening? But also, is he something that T.I. should be worried about? Where does Ethan Hawk come into all of this? It was a lot. Right? It was so much. I was just like, I don't, I don't know what's happening. Once we get to that point. At the beginning of the first half where it's just like small scope, it's just like these four guys committing a heist. Asa Gonzalez is chasing after them because she's a cop. Like, that part is super <laughs> cool. That part works for me. But, like, once we start getting into the bigger elements, I'm like, uh, uh, how does this all fit in? But everybody's performances are really good. Occasionally, they would, like, ace, like, the NOLA accent. And I was mm, just nice. like, yo, fam, that's a little, <laughs> it's a little too on. <laughs> so it's too on, I say, as somebody who is planning to visit New Orleans again this summer. But yeah, everybody does a great job. And also, it was just really nice to see Asa in a different type of role than I usually see her in. Although there was that one point where they call her white in the movie, and I was very confused for a long Yo, time. I remember, I was like, is she, is she is she playing a white woman? Yeah, exactly. Like, I didn't understand if her character is supposed to be white. Or if he was just calling her that because she's... Mexican? I don't know. Because she's not black. Like, does he not know what Mexicans are? I assume they don't have a lot of Mexicans in New Orleans. But I don't think that's a, a problem either, though. But I feel like they would they would know. I don't know. I don't know. It was That was a really weird moment for me. And I was like, I don't know what's happening here. But because uh, I think I actually paused and had to rewind that line because I was like, did I misunderstand this? Yeah. Also, I don't know. Full disclosure, I saw this at the drive-in, which is where I've been seeing most movies for like the last year. Yeah. So it's kind of hard to see everything. I don't know if I recognized her at first. She looks so tired why. throughout the entirety of this movie, and I love it. I was like, oh, that's Asa. So I don't know if I recognized her before or after the white thing. <laughs> but I remember thinking, like, wait, you said she was white. She's not white. What? <laughs> Is a character white? Is this adapted from something? <laughs> yeah, Is she playing a white woman? It was wild. It was That line is just wild to me, and I'm never going to forget it because I was so confused in that moment. Uh, I think I also really liked the cinematography in the movie, too. I thought, I think, if I'm remembering correctly, I think I really liked the way that it looked. But also, it's been a few months since I watched this movie, so I'm trying to recollect, like, everything that I felt about this movie after I saw it. All right. When did you watch it? Oh, my God. I want to say it was, like, January. Oh, yeah. wow. Okay. I watched it, like, nine months ago. <laughs> yeah. So, there is another seg section, I believe, where you talked about this movie. So, I don't have to spend too much time talking about yeah, it. Yeah. I talked about it at some point. One thing I didn't talk about, because you hadn't seen it yet, was um, the threat of raccoons biting dudes' dicks off comes up <laughs> much more than I expected. <laughs> yes. Like, the first time, I was, okay, I don't, is this how Southern criminals <laughs> do their this is a choice it's a choice they use raccoon they threaten to have raccoons bite dudes dicks off and then it comes up again later and i'm like yo what is up with these raccoons and why are you trying to feed your enemies dicks to these raccoons i don't know i i get it for like you know intimidation i'm not gonna cross you if, if that's, that's the, the punishment, punishment. <laughs> it's very effective but it's just not something i ever thought i'd see in a movie especially with ti yeah but also like that T.I. was like using his big T.I. words that he always uses. I can't think of any now because I saw the movie nine months ago. But there was one thing he said. And I was like, oh, OK. They let T.I. improv because he loves to flex that prison vocabulary. Oh, my God. That he picked up reading all them books in jail. All right, Dallas. What is the last <laughs> movie on your list? What is the last movie on my list? There it is. So this one is more proof that Warner Brothers is better at adapting their properties into animation than into live action. I'm not going to know what it is, but I feel like it's a, it might be a Justice League movie. You would think, given who I am and how I'm always talking about Justice League things on the quarantine is watch. Is it a but Batman surprise, one? It's Mortal Kombat Legends. Scorpion's oh. Revenge. Oh, <laughs> funny. Yes. I didn't know that that was an animated movie. Yeah. I had heard about it before, and then obviously people started talking about it more when the new Mortal Kombat came out. I think Sean brought it up last um, review. I think so. And then my cousin brought it up, and he actually showed it to me a couple of days ago. 
because he was very excited about it. He's, I think he saw it after we all saw Mortal Kombat together. Yeah. And well, now it's on HBO Max because they put all the Mortal Kombat movies up now. Yes. Directed by Ethan Spaulding, who directed Justice League, Throne of Atlantis, Son of Batman, and a bunch of episodes of Avatar, The Last Urban. And it was written by Jeremy Adams, who wrote for Young Justice and Supernatural. All of these things I like. Well, Throne of Atlantis wasn't my favorite, but that's fine. Everything else I really like. <laughs> It stars Patrick Seitz, Jennifer Carpenter, Joel McHale, Steve Bloom, Jordan Rodriguez, and Gray Delisle or Gray Griffin, depending on what she's credited as, depending on which thing you're watching. It might be Gray Delisle Griffin. Her Twitter is hyphenated, so I'm going to say Gray Delisle Griffin. And she has a very small role as Katana here, but I wanted to shout her out because she's one of my favorite voice actresses and she's in the movie. Anyway, summary. It's a long one. Get ready. Hanzo Hasashi loses his clan, family, and his life during an attack by the rival ninja clan, the Lin Kuei. He is given the chance to compete in an interdimensional tournament to save his loved ones while other fighters try to save the Earth realm from annihilation. It's a Mortal Kombat movie. They pretty much, they have that story that Mortal Kombat movies have. (laughs) There's a tournament. Liu Kang gotta go. Sonya Blade gotta go. Johnny Cage gotta go. Scorpion gotta die. Scorpion gotta come back. The thing here is... It's called Scorpion's Revenge, and it made me think that it was just going to be a movie focusing on Scorpion, which I'm down for. He has a dope story. He's like the Wolverine of Mortal Kombat, basically. Very upsetting backstory. Kind of has a berserker rage thing. Really likes Japanese women. He wears yellow. See? Wolverine. But, um, you know, instead of being a weeb, he's an actual Japanese man. But the thing about this is they also want it to be like a general Mortal Kombat movie. So we go away from Scorpion, and then we get to the standard tournament thing with Liu Kang and Sonya Blade and Johnny Cage and they're all fun because Johnny Cage is played by Joel McHale and that is perfect casting shout out to the casting director (laughs) I'm just like yo I don't I get that this is a Mortal Kombat movie but you called it Scorpion's Revenge I went where Scorpion's Revenge and it's only like 80 minutes because it's an animated Warner Brothers movie but the reason that I said they adapted it better is because there are things about the new Mortal Kombat even though I had a great time watching it that bothered me as a nerd who got really into the Mortal Kombat lore like in the last few months. But I can't spoil them. But I'll just say I have greater appreciation for this movie doing Scorpion's backstory more accurately. Because as great as that opening scene was in Mortal Kombat, the new one, I was like, wait, this isn't really how things... No, you got it. Mm." But I can't talk about that because spoilers. But I'll just say Quan Chi, for those who know what that means. Just not you two probably. Nope. Like, he's <laughs> in the movie? Because he's cool. Okay, so you know who Quan Chi is. He's the gray dude, he's bald, he does magic with skulls and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, so he's in this animated movie. Oh, nice. He kind of should have been in the Mortal Kombat movie. Yeah, for I reasons. kept waiting for him to show up. Yeah, but... Um, he didn't. Yeah, so I think the reason that I like this better as an adaptation is because they dive more into all of the Mortal Kombat stuff that we didn't get. Like, we didn't get Katana in the live-action movie. We got her in this one, played by Gray Delia Griffin. Shout out to Gray. I love you, girl. Um, it's super violent, super action-y. It's Mortal Kombat. That's fun. It's like very gory, which is what you'd expect. I don't know. There's something more palatable about it not being realistic because it's animated, but also less palatable because since it's animated, they're like, oh, we're going to go even harder. And I know what you're saying. If you saw the new one, a hat cut a woman in half. So it's like. They went crazy with the new one, too. But this one was like, oh, yeah. Every chance we get, x-ray shot. Kla! His spine is shattered. Kla! His arms are ripped off. Yeah, he's cut in half. Boom, heads explode. But that's what you go to Mortal Kombat for, because it's a game for psychopaths. Mm-hmm. Anyway, it was a fun time. I enjoyed it. It's only like 80 minutes. If you like Mortal Kombat and very, very, very violent animation, I recommend it. And uh, Sonya Blade is played by... One of the women from White Chicks. She so is fun. also from Dexter. Yes. Okay. That's what I was like. I've seen her more recently than White Chicks. What was it? Dexter. Dexter. She played Deb. Yeah. Shout out to Miss Carpenter. Which, by the way, Dexter's coming back this fall. Let's go. I saw a trailer for that. Yes. I was like, oh, snap. Dexter's back. I wonder if they're going to bring back the surprise guy. <laughs> no, he's he been alive? dead since like season one. Ah. Uh, really? Yeah. I think he died. I never watched the show. Like, I think he died like the episode after or something like that. That would be even better. That would be even more of a surprise if you bring him back. 
<laughs> he comes out of the grave surprised. There are a few people that I'm hoping that they bring back for Dexter. A lot of people are going to disagree with me, and it's a hot take, but I really want Yvonne Strahovski to come back at least for an episode just to see what she's doing. But anyway, this is not about that. We're going to move on to the next movie, <laughs> which uh, on my list is Malcolm and Marie, also on Netflix, directed by Sam Levinson and starring Zendaya and John David Washington. You guys may know Sam Levinson as the guy who created Euphoria. Oh, yeah. Okay. I knew I knew that name. So the synopsis, a director and his girlfriend's relationship is tested after they return home from his movie premiere and face each other's turmoil during one long night. This is another movie that did not live up to my expectations, Uh but the acting is fantastic, especially from Zendaya. Zendaya is just giving off performances recently. The entire movie is literally these two characters arguing, which can get very exhausting. That and and here's the thing. I've seen several movies recently where there are it's just two hours of characters arguing, but for some reason this one just didn't quite work for me. I think it was because the entire time I was just like, Zendaya, just leave him. What just leave him? <laughs> Stop arguing. Go to bed. Speaking of arguing, I have a question. Yeah. I have a question and a caveat. I need you to hold your answer until I give the caveat. Mm. Question is Which movie do you like better, this movie or Marriage Story? Caveat, before you answer, if you say Marriage Story, you are anti-black. Wow. (laughs) (laughs) Um, The floor is yours. First off, I am not anti-black. Second of all, (laughs) Malcolm and Marie might be anti-black. Third of all, (laughs) Marriage Story is definitely the better movie. Uh, uh, here's the thing about Marriage Story or not Marriage Story speaking of Malcolm and Memory <laughs> they both begin with M's I just realized that that's true oh yeah for the record I don't think Malcolm and Memory is anti-black <laughs> here's the thing about Malcolm and Memory it just felt like sometimes the dialogue was really inauthentic to who these people were like mm. these are two black people and I felt like some of the time I was just listening to not a black person making like their perspective known i was like this was written by somebody who's using these characters as their own like way of venting because the way john Uh. david washington's complaining about critics and about how critics talk about race or talk about movies or anything in general i was just like this doesn't feel this doesn't feel authentic at all Mm -hmm. as a black filmmaker as a black critic this doesn't feel like something that he would complain about it just felt so off remember i was talking when i talked about the falcon and the winter soldier there were times where i felt like i know that a black person is in this writer's room right because there are certain things that they would say where i was like oh yeah that feels like something we would pitch in a writer's room and even though i know zendaya and john david washington said that they contributed to the writing of this movie it still felt mostly like it was from a white man, which Mm. would be Sam Levinson. Right. And I'm looking up Sam Levinson and he looks, Colin, look at this picture. (sighs) (laughs) Hold on. Hold on. Let me, let me make sure I'm really seeing. You're saying getting a good sense of, of what that guy, this guy said, I'm going to (laughs) write a story about a black couple having an argument yes about this guy life about art about drug Mm -hmm. addiction Mm -hmm. about this guy all sorts of things yes 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 now here's the thing i love sam hold on 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 can y'all see no you probably can't yeah i just i just see a caucasian face oh 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 the eyes are coming oh oh uh-huh that's that right. came into focus aggressively. <laughs> aggressively. I wish yeah, people I could see what we're looking at right now, but it, it like came into focus so aggressively. Man. God, what was I saying? Okay, here's the thing about Sam Levinson, though. I love Euphoria. Right. I've said that on this podcast, I'm pretty sure. I love Euphoria. I love that show. I don't know what it is about the writing on Euphoria. It's just so much better than what was done here. And I don't know if it's maybe because I was seeing reviews of the movie before I saw it and they were like pretty middling to like pretty like harsh. Right. But the consensus was basically the same, which was the production design and the cinematography is absolutely stunning. Zendaya is acting her behind off, but the writing just isn't quite there. 
like we were in <laughs> I was I was hanging out with some people and we were watching the we watched the fir- like the opening of the movie just so that we could show this group of black people the macaroni and cheese that Zendaya makes him which is just Kraft's macaroni and cheese and we were like come on man come what? on I heard about that <laughs> what <laughs> what see the the problem with that is that like that's fine if like you're poor and that's all you can afford right you do what you got to do I know that is not the case for that. I just, I haven't seen the movie and I know. Oh, it's not. If you look at the house so, that it's filmed in, they're definitely so, not struggling. So you don't want to look up a recipe at all? If you don't have like a family one? Like, come on, girl, girl, what are you doing? No wonder they're arguing. <laughs> this is funny. Like, this is the second time I've heard that specific point made. I was listening to another podcast when the movie came out. I think it was Joe Budden's podcast. And he talked about, um, her making the the craft macaroni and cheese. It's like <laughs> of course this is what happens in the movie. Like we had an argument too. Also, that's the title screen. I don't know why that was the decision to make. She finishes making the mac and cheese. It's sitting on the counter and then the name of the movie pops up over the mac and cheese. I was like, why okay, that's a choice. Well, also, hold on. Oh, so that's like right at the beginning of the movie. Yeah. So that's why they're arguing. Uh, <laughs> no, I think Malcolm they start... Marie mac and cheese. Like I don't know what. <laughs> I want to say that they start arguing before the mac and cheese is even made. I don't know. It's, it, it doesn't help. It doesn't help. However, she's does a... he just start swinging when she puts it down? <laughs> no, like, he, he eats should. It. He eats it. He is a better man than I. No, I just Colin. He's not. He's all. He's. Oh, can't that's be. the that's the thing though. His character is so awful. Like I just oh. spend the whole movie just going, please leave him. Why are you even still arguing? Just leave. Also, I just disclaimer: I'm eating Kraft macaroni and cheese right now. Like that was my dinner tonight, and I'm just gonna say, <laughs> we have no beef with Kraft macaroni and cheese or anyone who eats it. <laughs> no, it's as, it's good. Like I enjoy yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. just when I when you know when I know that you have the resources that you could be doing some homemade shit. And I get like that might take more work, but come mm. on. Actually, not really. You have to boil the noodles and then put the shit in it for craft anyway. So like you're not doing that much more work. Girl, what are you doing? But Dallas, are you eating yours with only the cheese sauce that they provide you with? Or is there like some extra cheese you put on there or like oh, that that's that's a different story. That's all she put in it? She only put the cheese she sauce. She just used in the, it. the 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 packet? Yeah. I mean, did she like flavor? It was any kind of like, no. you know, garlic, salt, no. pepper, anything. She made it according to how you're supposed to make it. Okay, okay so mad at him. she. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that was an act of aggression. Oh no, it was an act of violence. She chose violence for sure. <laughs> I was gonna say a microaggression, but that's not micro. It was that's just straight no. up aggression. <laughs> was... Microwave aggression. She chose violence, but the thing is yeah. though that he proves himself to be an awful person as the movie goes on. So you kind of deserve that horrible mac and cheese, my guy. <laughs> Again, nothing against Kraft Mac and Cheese. <laughs> but there's more that you can do with it. There is open. more that you can do with it. <laughs> yes. And also if you're it that's I don't know if that's a if that's a demonstration of love right there. It's okay, the thing is the idea of making food for your spouse, that is a demonstration of love. But when you make <laughs> basic Kraft Mac and Cheese that you've done absolutely nothing to besides what's in the box. That is a declaration of hate, so it cancels out. <laughs> okay, anyway, moving on from the mac and cheese. Like I said, the cinematography is great, production design is great, which is a bit harder to do when you're filming in black and white. Right. What parts of the movie actually work? They work because of Zendaya and John David Washington. Mostly Zendaya, but, you know, they're both really good in this movie. I am a fan of Zendaya. I am a fan of John David Washington. To a degree, I am a fan of Sam Levinson, just not this movie. All right, that's fair. It's funny. Yeah, I saw the trailer and I was like, oh, this is going to be them arguing for a while. And then um, I thought, I don't I don't need to see that. That was my life in high school. Oh, man. Um, we're going to move on to the next movie that I have on my list because Dallas has run out of movies. And we I followed go- the structure and we've been going on for a while now. But I'm going to I'm going to leave it on a high note. My next movie is Demon Slayer Mugen Train. If you guys listen to our oh, last nice. episode, I talked about the TV series Demon Slayer. And I'm going to talk about the movie that just came out. Uh, the movie stars Natsuki Hane, Akari Kito, Hiro Shimono, Yoshitsugu Masaka, and Satoshi Hino. Hino. I don't I hope I pronounced that right. It's Hino. Hino. Thank you. I say Collins are a Japan guy. Hino. Yeah. Yeah. Or 
Zach Aguilar, Abby Trott, Alex Lay, Bryce Pappenbrook, and Mark Witten, depending on wh- whether you saw the sub or the dub version, as Tanjiro, Nezuko, Zenetsu, Inosuke, and Rengoku. The summary is Tanjiro Komodo joined with Inosuke Hashibira, a boy raised by boars who wears a boar's head, and Zenitsu Agatsuma, a scared boy who reveals his true power when he sleeps, board the Infinity Train on a new mission with the Flame Hashira, Kyojuro. I'm sorry, it's called the Infinity Train? It's called the Infinity Train. Okay. With the Flame Hashira, uh, Kyojuro, Rengoku, to defeat a demon who has been tormenting the people and killing the demon slayers who oppose it. So when I first finished the first season of the show, I was like, awesome. You know, I was really looking forward to a second season. And then I found out there was a movie. And not only was there a movie, but the movie was going to be a continuation of that first season, which meant I needed to watch the movie so that I could be up to date for when the second season came out, whenever it does come out. I don't know what the details are on that. I just got into the show. Audience, you know, if you listen to our last episode, that Demi is a weeb now. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, so, I talked about that. I don't okay, know if cool. I like being called that, but sure. No one likes not? being called that. <laughs> well, some people own up to it, but it's you. It's what you are. You just gotta shout accept out to it. Joe if you're listening. Joe, we love uh, you. I don't know if I like it just because I love just I love things in general. So like, yeah, but no, but you're going through a weeb phase. Yeah, weebs love things. It's just if one of those things is. <laughs> weave things i love lots of things guys but anyway i loved the continuation of this series i saw the movie in imax which was dope nice also this was the first time i ever watched demon slayer with subs instead of watching a dub mostly because you could only watch it in imax with the subs but i also don't have a problem with reading subtitles it's just sometimes i choose the dubs because it's a lot easier for me to like do other things while also watching the show Mm -hmm. If I'm watching it with subs, I absolutely have to put everything aside and not yeah. do anything else because I need to be able to read the subtitles as well as get a look at what's happening on screen at the same time. But yeah, the action, just like on the show, is super fantastic, especially in the third act. But even better for me was that the villain wasn't what I was expecting them to be at all, which means that the movie itself kind of played out differently from what I was expecting, which is really fun. Just like on the show, the demons are really creative and have really unique abilities. Uh, Rengoku is a great character with some pretty interesting quirks, which is kind of like quite a number of the supporting characters on the show. They're all like outside of Tanjiro, they're all like really interesting, but they've also got like really quirky things about them, I guess you could say, which I really like. The ending of that of the movie to me feels just as triumphant as it does heartbreaking. It does not necessarily have, like, the happiest of endings. I'm pretty sure the last shot is of Tanjiro crying. Oh. But it's a really great movie. And the animation is so, 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 so good. Like, I was like, wow, watching this, like, on an IMAX screen was, like, definitely the choice to make here. And I was really happy about that. I've been interested in and I've been drawing in the manga and anime styles off and on since I was about seven years old. So I always really, like... I've always really liked that art style. So now I'm just watching it consistently, which has gotten me back into drawing. So it's really cool. Nice. I really enjoyed the movie, and I'm really looking forward to the next adventure of Tanjiro, Nezuko, Zenitsu, and Inosuke. Probably be really cool. Can't wait for a season two. It's going to be dope. But as I said in the last podcast, season one is currently on Netflix, if you want to check that out. And the movie is currently in theaters, so check it out while you still can if you like Demon Slayer. And that nice. is all we've got for you guys today. Nice. As always, thank you, audience, for listening to all of our ramblings. We talked about mac and cheese for way longer than I expected. It was fantastic, though. Yeah, it was great. It was I great. also appreciate uh, your marriage story uh, question, despite the caveat that you gave me, because I don't agree with it. It's not my fault marriage I mean, story is a better movie. This is what Dallas does, though. I mean... It, it is, but it's not my fault marriage story is a better movie. It's just not. I could have gone full president biden with it and said if you don't vote for malcolm and marie then you ain't black oh my gosh but i decided not to do that although i said anti-black it's close no but that's different you weren't denouncing her blackness (laughs) dallas would never i would never to me it's too black for that thank you i appreciate that no problem thank you audience thank you uh craft macaroni and cheese thank you everybody (laughs) Thank you, Crown Digital, Brandon and I, for putting us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Demi, thank you for editing and putting us on YouTube and finally talking about Cutthroat City with me. We've been waiting like two years to finally talk about that movie together. It's been so long. Like we were, 
we were on a different podcast a different channel on youtube talking no. about cutthroat city we were out. no yeah yeah it was on our most anticipated list Ooh. like three years ago oh my god yeah it's one of those colin thank you for knowing who quan chi is because yeah. nothing and i will say nothing makes me feel like more of a nerd than wanting to talk about the accurate depiction of scorpion's backstory and how it relates to quan chi and having no one to talk to about that that's like how cousin. I feel about most nerdy things that I bring up on this show sometimes. Exactly. <laughs> yep. Yeah, and then Colin just sits there quietly holding all Welcome this nerdy to my life. Him. But yeah, audience, let us know what, you, what you've been doing during the pandemic. Have you seen any of the movies that we've watched? Do you have any hentai to recommend for Demi? No, 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 no. I'm not going in that direction. <laughs> Do I? No. See, I've never watched like, Here's the thing. actual full episodes of hentai, so I wouldn't be able to do recommendations. I'm learning that anime itself, most of it is just like naturally horny for some weird reason and, I, and <laughs> well, i'm no. not fond of that there's a Listen, lot of horny the minute, shit but you can avoid the horny the shit. minute midnight showed up on my hero academia i was like what's happening here okay see that's an interesting question right because no midnight's horny never mind i was thinking like mountain lady no no midnight not inherently is. horny it's big yeah yeah she's inherently horny stand by i'm gonna do some googling here oh yeah no go look up that picture of midnight real quick also dallas i'm gonna need you to watch Jeez. my hero academia you are, I want to say the, I'll be. No, now that I've seen it, you person ab- to tell no, me that? now that I've seen it, you absolutely. Have oh, to watch it. okay. So anybody else telling him doesn't matter, but now that you say it, yes, now he yeah. has to watch yeah, it. Yeah, because kind of bullshit. Because me and Dallas have an understanding. Run up, bitch. Dallas and I have a I'm superhero seeing... understanding. We vibe. That's true. Oh, we do. Okay. I'm seeing a lot of cosplay, but yeah, send me your hentai recommendations. Don't. You can. T- <laughs> You can find us on Twitter at y'all underscore different. You can find us on Instagram and Tumblr at Creative Differences Podcast. Or you can find us on Facebook.com slash Creative Differences PC. If you want to talk to me about anything we talked about today, mac and cheese, anti-blackness, what they actually put in my arm, because it probably wasn't Pfizer. <laughs> you can you can find me on Twitter at a king named Simba. You can find me on Twitter at Duck McGuck. You guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Dreamy Films. Dreamy is spelled D-R-E-E-M-I. Thanks again for joining us. And you can find Gabby on Twitter at Vaccinated Vixen. Ooh. Oh, that's, that's pretty good. That's a good one. Yeah. Tamer than usual. She should probably steal that one. It's not bad, right? Yeah. yeah. Pretty good. I was going to say Mommy Moderna, but that's not bad. <laughs> that's a lot. Yeah, right? That's a lot. Anyway. I mean, now you said it. So. Exactly. Now I got the got that two for one. Oh, deal. but it's not the official one though so it's fine no that's her uh that's her burner account <laughs> it's been different bye bye